has begun. Money. We will take it away. We'll put it back in a pool. And we will reallocate it to the firms and to the companies and to the banks that are having the most performance. And we've taken money away very quickly. This has been really interesting, and I have to say that um, I was really skeptical of, of it. And so was uh, you know, some of our colleagues when we were talking about it originally with Lawrence, like it had never been done before. And we were, we were worried about the implications. But you can't argue with the results. Um, 50 million, almost $50 million lent against uh, $839,000 that we've paid out so far in grant money. And we've, we've got another million dollars in grant money to go. So imagine how much more financing we're likely to be able to obtain. So these are some of the financial institution partners that have been most successful. I wasn't able to get um, logos of some of the smaller uh, rural banks, but it's not only for the big financial institutions. It's really been useful for um, getting and re-energizing some of the rural uh, community banks and uh, microfinance institutions and even non-bank financial institutions and NGOs. These are some of our, our metrics, and we use these in our weekly reports. I mean, it's pretty simple. Our COR is able to know how much we got in financing and the difference between the, the week before and this. So far, we've been able to achieve combined between the two subsidy sort of tools, and they also work together. There is a little bit of over overlap between the two, $61 million. And in fact, I checked my phone before I came in, and it's actually $63 million as of this morning. So it changes daily. Um, and this is the distribution of financial institutions that have really taken this and run with it. Now, you'll see there's one that's clearly the leader of the pack. That's Barclays Bank. And they saw this as a really neat opportunity to totally reinvigorate their agribusiness lending desk. And they've put a lot of resources of their own and cost share of their own into making this work. And they've been a really fantastic partner. They're on our Christmas list this year, and I think vice versa. Um, Echo Bank is, is, is closely behind them. And they're actually what we've created and what we found with this tool is it's created a competition amongst the financial institutions on who's going to position themselves to be the leader in agribusiness finance in Ghana. And we couldn't have imagined that when we started. I mean, they were like, ugh, agribusiness, please. We have T-bills to buy. You know? So um, th there's a smattering of other institutions. I think the other thing that's interesting in terms of who's getting the financing is there's about 25 companies that are probably getting the majority of financing, but huge numbers that are receiving small financing amounts. And that's, that's really interesting. So, Although the sheer numbers of um, financing being released by some of the smaller actors here, those are reaching many more uh, numbers of firms. So that's, that's really important. So overall, I think for every dollar we're spending, um, we're getting $31 of private sector capital leveraged to these value chains. That's now. And we were worried about portfolio at risk because it, you know, it doesn't really help if you're stimulating banks to make bad loans. <laughs> we are on top of the portfolio at risk extremely closely. Our team are like repo men practically. That every single deal, they want to make sure that, they're, um, that the quality of the loan is good. And right now, we're at under 3%. Of course, these are, some of these loans are six months, a year, et cetera. Um, so we'll, we'll see where um, portfolio at risk is next year. A few more metrics. Um, this is sort of how things have worked out in terms of which value chains are getting the financing. The name in the game in agribusiness in Ghana is poultry, you know, and that means soy and rice, and soy and maize are really getting the majority of. But we're doing a sort of a special push this year to make sure that rice gets its fair share. Um, most of our loans, most of our um, financing is in the form of loans, but there is equity. And most recently, we started actually paying for performance for business advisory service providers to list SME firms on the Ghana Alternative Stock Exchange. So we're moving really heavily into equity, which is really cool. Um, in terms of the breakdown, it's about $37 million in, in working capital and about $20 million in capital expenditure. So it's not just working capital. And we're trying to make a push to make it more capital expenditure. But you know, it's not an either or sort of thing. You can have a factory, but if you don't have the inputs, the factory is empty. So. Uh, just some more results. Um, here's Andrew Akiaku. He's the head of Barclays Bank. I have to say thank you to Andrew because he's done quite a bit. Um, and this is just a view of some of the um, different uh, beneficiaries of this program, motorcycles and, and women who um, 
who take their rice to a rice miller that now has financing and is able to make a lot more money as a result. There's more than six, actually this, this number up here is wrong, that 600 firms are getting help. Um, and we have, in addition to the $63 million in financing that we've released, we have another $200 million in the pipeline of deals identified, business advisory services working on it. So I think we're going to at least reach $150 million of financing and maybe more. Um, so what are some of these key success factors? Why, why did this work essentially in Ghana? Um, and I think that the, 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 the dual uh, subsidy, both from the supply and demand side, I think was interesting. Um, I also think that, you know, and many of you work with the private sector and it's a bit of a, it can be a bit of a departure from some implementing partners, uh, especially to work with financial institutions. You really do need to approach them differently and, you, you, you know, this, you have to prepare them for what, um, what it is to work with USAID and excite them about the possibility as well. And we had to do an RFI. We had to do a lot of bidders conferences because this, what we did, had never been done before in Ghana, and it's almost a little too good to be true. Like you're going to pay us to lend, and what? How is this going to work? What do you really want from us? We had to be really clear about issues of confidentiality, um, and so we spent a lot of time in the preparation stage. Lawrence is actually critical in that in our um, mission in Ghana, and we made the application process really simple. I mean, you don't ask a banker to write a 20-page proposal. I mean, it's going to be terrible, first of all. They'll do a fantastic spreadsheet, and so we tried to really change the way that grant applications were done. I mean, two pages. What do I really want to know? There was really only one metric. What's it going to take? And how much are you going to lend? And when? And, and make sure, and how are you going to assure me that it's in the value chains and to the types of clients that, that we're looking for? Um, we also had to, I think this is hard for a lot of us, had to resist the temptation of trying to mandate how. You know, how is, that's not for me, it's not for us to come in and tell a financial institution how to function, essentially. We just, we have a result, you have the money, let's, let's do this. Um, and really, and, and I think, you know, but it, but it was hard. It was, it, it, was a difficult, it was a difficult thing to do. And we went through a number of design processes of the RFI, and each time, in, in the RFA, each time saying, how can we stop being so directive? How can we be less directive? Do we have to say this? I mean, honestly. So we, we, we did a couple of different designs. We made the um, grant very short term. Actually, we did it with a base period and an option period. And if you didn't spend your money by the base, we basically said we're taking it away, reducing your ceilings, and we will reallocate. And we did that. Um, but when, and that actually helped because then the financial industry was like, no, 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 but we have all these deals. It's just a question of time. Well, then get to work because we have, you know, program and we need results. Um, and that actually created competition and also it got the fire going even higher. I also think that these, you know, incentive grants are complemented by a lot of other risk mitigating um, things that are happening in Ghana. And, <clears throat> you know, honestly, I think the most important thing is that there are deals. There are good deals. Without good deals, you're not going to get good financing. <laughs> There's a lot of great entrepreneurs in Ghana and West Africa in general. Um, and we have great business advisory service providers, too. I mean, we have, you know, a lot of London-based financial experts. You know, these are serious people. One of our BAS firms is, is you know, KPMG and equity investors and things like that. I mean, we have uh, some, some impressive partners there. Um, there's the guarantee program that we're working closely with and other agricultural insurance. But I think, you know, we also do a little bit of bank training, not a lot, but some, uh, on things like risk mitigation and value chain finance and, um, and how to evaluate risk. But mostly I think the most important thing is that our, our project team is so strong and they play this really great sort of honest broker role. And I think that's really what made the difference in terms of the financial institution saying, okay, yes, I'll do this. Because if aid is involved and these guys are involved, I trust these guys, I know this is going to work out. So. That's it. Thank you. A lot of questions about that. Great presentation. Um, I think we have uh, Theo here um, for the Center for Global Development who is able to present on his paper. Hello. Yeah. Can everyone can, can everyone hear me? Can I get some feedback? You have to get going in a little bit. So if you could just go ahead and 
Give it a whirl. Hopefully, we'll be able to bring you in. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just need a signal that this is actually coming through on your audio. It is actually it coming through. Thank you very much. Well. 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 Okay. Uh, if, if somebody who's joining online could maybe use, use a headset because we're getting feedback from that as well. But to everyone in the room, thank you so much for being here. I know it's a little bit weird to have a disembodied voice speaking at you over some slides. Um, and uh, I'd just like to thank Lawrence and Amanda for some really interesting presentations that I was able to catch. And apologize to Adam, uh, because uh, in very poor seminar etiquette, I have another call, which uh, I've had to push, and now we'll have to jump on uh, not too long after my presentation. Um, so without further ado, I, I think I'm kind of standing on the, the, the shoulders of giants here, because I've been scooped in a lot of what I was uh, going to say by, by two really excellent preceding presentations. Um, and I think I'd just like to build on it and maybe try to give us all some context of why paying for performance or paying for success or these kind of uh, outcome-based contracts are really, to our eyes, uh, the future of a lot more of what's going to happen in development and therefore relevant to what we do as practitioners and what we do as donors. So uh, here's what I'd like to take the next few minutes to talk to you about. I'm going to start by asking start by asking Let's start by asking Let's start by asking Let's start by Hello. 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 I'm going to start by. Um, start by. Um, um, start by. Um, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead and try again, Theo. Okay, how's that? All right, I think I think we might have lost the echo. Let's let's keep going. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, thanks for everyone's patience. Here's what I'd like to take the next few minutes to discuss. Uh, I'm going to start by asking us to think through what a paying for performance model could look like, uh, which which very much reflects some of the excellent stuff that Amanda and uh, Lawrence have been saying. I'm going to try and convince you that a paying for performance model doesn't, by design, have to cost us more than other ways we've traditionally worked with uh, sponsoring development outcomes, like subsidies or cheap loans. Um, next, I'm going to try and give you the view from 30,000 feet, which is, uh, you know, why, why is this going to be a bigger part of how we're working with the private sector and how we're going to do development, quote unquote, uh, as we work to build out the SDG agenda? Um, and finally, I'm going to try and convince you about the merits of paying for performance in really general terms. And part of that is working to convince ourselves that paying for performance isn't a really new uh, way of doing business, and it's reflected in a lot of contracts that we're very comfortable with. As Adam will talk about after, after my presentation, uh, one way to think about it is this a, a new and useful form of procurement. Um, and I won't, I won't speak too much about that, but I'd like us to kind of realize that many of the things we're talking about are is new terminology, but we've been doing it in various forms and very successfully as a sector for a long time. So uh, Bridge International Academy is, is a brand that, that many of us are familiar with. Uh, they're an in innovative education startup uh, disrupting private education provision and competing with the public sector in parts of urban Kenya. Um, I think they've done really amazing work. And I'm using a bridge project here as an example. I really want to stress that I'm not picking on them in any way. I just want us to think through what it means to, um, to, to do this kind of programming in practice. So uh, the slides were actually changed, uh, and, and the font should be a different color, so I, I apologize. But uh, what does bridge do? They provide uh, schooling for about $6 a month in areas where household income is as low as about $6, $60 a month uh, per adult head. So you know this is this is still a substantial percent, 10 percent of your gross income, but people are voting with their feet. As we've learned all over the world from a large number of development research programs and projects, uh, competitive private schooling for the very poor is still a competitive proposition. And the way Bridge does business is by radically focusing on costs. 
So they keep costs low by scripting lessons, so they don't need to hire uh, very expensive teachers. They keep costs low by using M-Pesa, which is a digital payment technology. They keep costs low by um, only building their school buildings using uh, three template designs, for example. And it's an amazing operation to really see. And as a consequence of this, they want to scale up. And their scale-up plan calls for 237 new schools, uh, enrolling an additional 300,000 additional students, uh, and costing about $26 million. So large relative to what they had and their cash flow, but pretty small in the scheme of things. And how did they do it? Well, they're a poster child, right? No pun intended. And of course, CDC, the UK's Development Finance Institution, and the IFC were happy to provide equity for this scale-up plan. And a cheap loan came from OPEC, which is the US capitalized development finance institution with a mandate to invest in American and American partly owned businesses overseas. So let's think through what these, what these instruments could have looked like. What happened was that they got a concessional loan. And I don't know if the interest rate was really 4%. OPEC doesn't make that information public. But it's lower. It's less than the commercial rate. Uh, so we'll use that as a benchmark. And what is the level of guarantee of debt? So a debt guarantee says, if you default on your $10 million loan, we'll bail you out. You won't be on the hook for that. We'll repay the bank. A guarantee would have cost uh, $9.9 .9 million. They'd have to guarantee $9.9 .9 million of that $10 million roll. And one other way to think about this is, what if we just looked at the gap between a, a commercial interest rate and a concessional interest rate and divided that by the number of students Bridge was hoping to enroll? And that works out to something really modest, right? A pay-for-success student, if our target outcome, as Lawrence was talking about earlier, or our, our clear metric that Amanda alluded to is student enrollment or test scores or some combination of the two, that works out to about $3 per student. Now, all of these in our algebra and our you know, very simple financial modeling have the same expected cost to the donor community, but we think they have dramatically different values to bridge and dramatically different incentive effects on the sector. So looking at these in order, what's the difference between a subsidy, a guarantee, and a paying for success or a paying for performance model? We shouldn't believe that they have the same effects or deliver the same development returns. Subsidies reduce costs, sure, because a cheaper loan is cheaper, but a general subsidy isn't targeted. OPIC's loan reduced Bridges' average cost of capital, so everything it did, rather than focusing our scarce development resources on what we wanted to create an incentive for, which is enrollment. The same with the guarantee. But do we really want to insulate, in the case of a guarantee, firms from risks that they should be facing? I would argue in most cases, probably not. Paying for success or paying for performance models, in contrast, don't pay out for the outcomes that aren't related to the social returns we're really interested in. So even though these have the same costs by design, they have very different market effects. And so all we've done is take a real example of an actual way we've supported the private sector, and many would argue we did a really good thing in doing that, and think about how else we could have done that, and what thinking about it in other ways implies for where the risks lie and where the incentives are placed. So I'm going to actually skip through the next few slides um, in the interest of saving some time. But the punchline of, of, of where this push is coming from to work with the private sector is essentially from a very high level and almost universal. So why is there a big number 18 on your screen? Well, those of us who were in Addis for the uh, Financing for Development conference earlier this year, uh, in the snappily titled Addis Ababa Action Agenda, uh, read uh, the words private sector no less than 18 times. And that's as many times as the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, which is all about how to pay for the sustainable development goals, that's as many times as it mentions the words international cooperation. And so I think that looking globally, there's kind of been a sea change in our attitude as a development sector and our willingness and appetite to work with private sector firms. And that's exciting news for service providers, right? This is a, a vast new and competitive playing field. Where is that push really coming from? I don't think it's any surprise to say that a lot of it is because when we started to add up what paying for the SDGs would cost, we started to see these really, really big numbers. And the specific numbers you have on your screen are in trillions of dollars a year. And the prices come from uh, calculations by UNCTAD in the 2014 World Investment Report. And I think we can all agree that the UN has a vested interest in, in 
you know, putting up large numbers. It itself is the beneficiary of large development spending. But everyone kind of agrees that it's going to be really expensive to build out delivery for the SDGs. And everyone really agrees that in the context of overseas development assistance of $130 billion a year or so in 2013, which itself was a record year for development assistance, we're not going to get there with foreign aid alone. So there's two pushes. One is we want to build out our collaboration with the private sector for better results. And we want to build out our collaboration with the private sector because it's the only way we're going to get to the SDGs. And as a consequence of that, there's a sea change in our attitude towards the private sector that really wasn't there, I'd say, 10 or 5 years ago and will be there for the next couple of decades. So the question we need to ask ourselves as donors and as practitioners, people in delivery and frontline organizations, is are we doing it well? So a really simple way for us to think about this, I think, uh, and, and I hope this tool is useful, is that there are a lot of projects that have high social returns but low risk-adjusted financial returns. And the problem with that is that there are many outside options that investors could invest in if they didn't take on these social projects. Why would I invest in the very risky and comparatively low return Kenyan schools run by Bridge when I could invest in at least Ghanaian national debt? You know, as we heard before, treasuries are a thing. Uh, there are securities I'm more familiar with. There are projects on which I have to do less due diligence. And so the problem facing these socially impactful projects is how to convince the private sector to get on board. And that really means two things, right? In this framework, we need to raise the return or we need to reduce the risk. And that brings us back full circle to the instruments we've been talking about in this sector for a long time. Guarantees and various kinds of, for example, political risk insurance reduce risk. Or we can give a subsidy, increase returns, lump sum transfers or subsidized credit like a cheap loan, which a lot of our development organizations, multilateral development banks, and at a very macro level, IDA, the World Bank soft loan window, has been doing for a long time. The new push, I think, and I think the healthy push, is towards paying for success models, subsidies that are conditional on performance. We've talked a little bit about what a subsidy looks like. This is a concessional loan to Bridge. And I argued that we can love Bridge, but have very good reason, reasons for thinking of other kinds of contracts that would have had the same expected cost, but kept risks and incentives in different places. What's the guarantee look like? And again, I realize I'm di diving in from London, so I just want to assure you that I'm not picking on USAID or, or US-associated uh, firms at all. This is just one example from a long list. Um, this is a press release, uh, I think, from earlier uh, last year, 2014, in which USAID partnered with Kenya Commercial Bank with a backstop facility. So it's a $10 million loan, pretty small, that says to Kenya Commercial Bank, you make loans to Kenyan clinics so that Kenyan clinics can buy medical equipment from GE. What's the problem with this? The guarantee protects Kenya Commercial Bank from loans to clinics, but it increases Kenya Commercial Bank's incentives to make loans that it wouldn't otherwise make. It distorts their incentives, and other than that, it's tied, right? We're using the American aid budget to buy equipment from American manufacturers. Now, I actually think, as an economist, that uh, industrial policy can be a really good thing, but I'd really like our development budgets not to be used for it. So in addition to being distortionary, giving a bank the incentive to make loans it might otherwise not, it's also tied in a way that I think is unhealthy. And is it really additional? Are we really making the same quality of loans when we have a backstop as we would when we don't? I would argue that our experience with commercial banking probably suggests not. So much in the same way as I think we can spend subsidies better, I think the expected cost of a guarantee can be spent better. So there's a few things that we go through in our paper. And I realize that, that no one's idea of a fun Friday night in is reading a paper about how this might all work. But if you want to skim it, I'd love to hear your comments. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of points that we make. And, and one of them is kind of on, on a public finance perspective that we haven't yet really heard about. I'm going to talk about uh, why paying for performance could incentivize better performance, create conditions for better contestability, and build better public support. So better performance, this is one of them. Even a highly motivated startup like Bridge would be more motivated to increase enrollment if that's how it could increase returns. It might even find new and innovative ways of enrolling students if its incentives were so aligned. So I think that paying for performance aligns our incentives in ways that other, other technologies, other types of contracts might not. 
Contestability. In most other ways of thinking about subsidies, it relies on someone picking a winner. It relies on us to say, this firm should get our support through a cheap loan or a guarantee for its debt. That's not the case with pay-for-performance contracts because at least in theory, and at least increasingly in practice, we could say any firm that meets these conditions can compete for the reward and will contract on a per-student or per-outcome basis. And finally, we all have examples from having spent a few years working in various emerging markets or frontier markets of the costs of excess optimism by our aid policymakers and our officials. Because the returns in pay for performance don't need to be targeted on a single company, they reduce the cost of us making mistakes, like excess optimism about specific projects. Some of us have worked in civil services or treasuries, um, and I know that from personal experience, uh, the politicians I know would rather report that they paid for an extra 100,000 Kenyan students to be enrolled in school or increase their test scores than to say, we spent $10 million paying off someone's bank debt because the project failed. So paying for performance not just aligns incentives in ways that other contracts don't. I think paying for performance also protects us from our own excess optimism about bad projects and helps to build support for development spending on good ones. So this is, in short, I think a simple idea uh, about which we've heard some very interesting things already from Lawrence and Amanda and Will from Adam, who's, who's coming up next. The simple idea is this. Conditional subsidies carry the same cost, but they have unique benefits from a public finance perspective, from an optics perspective, from a public outreach perspective. And I don't think they're a new idea. And my last two slides will be talking about how they're not really a huge new innovation, but rather a rediscovery of things that have been used in other formats and other places. But I think that they should be much more widely used. And increasingly, the pressure will be on development actors and funders to use them more widely. So I want to talk very quickly about one of my favorite examples of this that dates from a time when we weren't even leapfrogging landlines. So some of us will be familiar with, with, with Peru's uh, geography. And uh, in the 90s, uh, the telecoms regulator, which was which is government operated, FITEL, uh, wanted to build out connections for landlines in rural areas of the country, uh, bringing telephone connections to places that just had never had them before. Um, and so uh, to get there, what they did was, I think, really interesting and plays into this conversation. Fitel set out the number of connections they needed and where they were needed. They also set out the terms for service delivery, which penalties for bad service delivery, drop connections, etc. And then they invited firms, outside firms and domestic incumbents, to bid on the level of subsidy they needed to provide this service over a certain time frame. And as a consequence of the combination of contracting on outcomes and using bidding to get those payments, those subsidies, as low as possible, they got their build out uh, to 5,000 towns and I think 600 district capitals for 41% less than they'd estimated, 71% less than the incumbent telecoms operator was offering, and with additionality of two for one. Uh, so for every dollar of subsidy the government was willing to put in conditional on performance, the uh, new operator put in $2 of infrastructure investment. And that's not really including the depreciation or operating costs that they'd have to incur. So this is an example of how we've been doing this pay for performance uh, interaction with the private sector for a long time. Some other macro examples that I just want to go through very quickly before concluding, uh, advanced market commitments. Uh, the advanced market commitment is the commitment to buy treatments or vaccines from pharma companies. And this creates an incentive for them to do research into drugs that uh, treat problems that you know, typically are most densely concentrated in the lowest income places. And the advanced market commitment for vaccines, for the pneumococcal vaccine specifically, uh, was hugely successful. It created an incentive for them to create a proper formulation of that vaccine, which is being rolled out by Gavi internationally. Uh, and it's now, I think, according to their own impact evaluation, estimated to have saved something like 500,000 children's lives. But again, it was contracting on a per-dose outcome for an agreed metric, which is vaccine efficacy. Similarly, as we'll hear about a little bit later, we have social and development impact bonds that do the same thing, moving savings from the public sector to reward the private sector for taking on risks. And social impact bonds, as I believe Adam will mention later, uh, have been used uh, in pilot studies and are being scaled up in various places 
as diverse as uh, treating sleeping sickness in sub-Saharan Africa to rewarding better outcomes for education for girls in Rajasthan, uh, an Indian state. And finally, we have cash on delivery aid, which once again contracts on a, on a high level, visible metric like how well are our kids doing in school, how many kids are getting to school, how many school meals are they consuming. And this has been used in a couple of different pilot projects, most interestingly, and with the most direct link back to the bridge example I started out with, uh, by DFID in a major project in Ethiopia. And I'm looking forward to reading the, uh, the, the impact evaluation from how that's worked and, and lessons learned from these kinds of cash on delivery aid models. So what's my elevator pitch? Uh, you've, you've been stuck with me and some exciting feedback uh, in the elevator for a few minutes, so I thank you for your patience. Um, I'd like to leave us with a couple of thoughts. Those of us who are donors and purchasers are under increasing political pressure to deliver outcomes in development, not just because of how much it will cost to build out the SDGs, but also because our development budgets on both sides of the Atlantic are under a lot of scrutiny. And I think that's healthy scrutiny, but it's scrutiny nonetheless. And those of us who are in practice, and I think many of us in the room have been on one side or the other of that divide or are going between them, those of us who are in practice working on delivery uh, are competing with a much wider field than ever before. Paying for performance is going to be a much, much bigger share of how we meet the SDGs. And I think that shift is ultimately a good thing. Not in all cases, not for all programs, but in many more sectors and in many more programs than is currently being used. And so I guess our challenge, or my challenge to all of us, is if we want to stay in business as both donors uh, and practitioners, as both policymakers and people engaged in delivery, if we want to stay in this business, paying for performance is increasingly the business we need to be in. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, I have a couple of minutes, um, and I'd like to hear some of Adam's presentation. And my apologies that I won't be able to take questions because I have to get on another call. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this. I look forward to hearing your comments and your criticisms and hopefully your pushback. Um, and I'd also really like to thank everyone for facilitating and especially the technical team for making this all work despite some, uh, despite some challenges. Thanks so much. Thank you, Theo. I know you've got to run, so we'll just take one or two questions quickly if we can. Uh, but again, he's at the uh, Center for Global Development. Excellent paper. I highly recommend it. Questions for Theo? Uh, Theo, um, just your paper, uh, just you want to just describe it, where they can get it? Um, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, you, can, you can get the paper, which, which talks about this in a little bit more detail, uh, and everything I touched on at uh, CGDEV, which is the website for my organization, the Center for Global Development. Uh, and my email address is on there. I'm happy for you to connect with me. Uh, I'd love to hear any follow-up questions, and I'm sorry I can't stay with you for much longer. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, that's great, um, and we can provide the... Uh, the uh, link for the paper to you as well. Again, I strongly recommend it. Thank you so much, Theo. And now we'll turn it over to uh, Adam. Great. Thank you so well, much. Good morning. It's been uh, interesting. Good morning. Thanks, Theo. Um, I'm going to take five minutes to go through my, my quick presentation so we have time for answers and for questions and answers. Um, so I work for uh, USAID, part of the Global Development Lab. Um, I look after innovative finance. Um, just to take a kind of a step back and think about some of the conversations we heard today from Amanda and Theo. Um, Amanda talked about mobilizing resources and how do you sort of put liquidity in the market and using some sort of pay for performance mechanism to reward the financiers, the people that are actually providing the capital. Um, Theo sort of talked a little bit more about um, different structures but kind of focused a bit on the conditional subsidies and again adding liquidity to the market a bit. Um, kind of what I want to focus on is something that's slightly different and in that space, which is really not talking about subsidies and not talking about liquidity. It's more about the whole holistic ecosystem of pay for performance. And this is around something called a development impact bond or an impact bond. And so if you think about development today, it's very rigid in the way it's funded. And yet the environments that we operate in are very liquid and unpredictable and very dynamic. 
So why are we funding with rigid structures when we need to respond to liquid environments? So what I like to think about when I look at development is sort of trying to find a way where things gain, where things gain from disorder and chaos. Complexity theory, chaos. I love that. And I think that's how we have to think about development and how we program for it. And so a development impact bond, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the structure, but let me just give it to you really quickly here. It's basically a contract. It's a procurement contract. It's essentially paying for results. And what we're doing is that we're bringing private investors up front to bear the risk of an investment. So we're basically front-loading a grant program or development program. And that money streams in down to an impact manager or a service provider. So private sector money drops into a bucket. The service providers receive it. They do their work. And at the end, during certain milestones, once certain milestones are reached, they're repaid. And the people who are repaying them are called outcome donors or outcome funders. In this case, it might actually be like a USAID or a World Bank or even a country in that regard. Um, this is the basic structure. And um, we can talk more about it on the answers and, qu and question side. But let me sort of like squeeze through this stuff really quickly and, and just kind of focus on the difference. So in a traditional, in a traditional bond or sorry, a traditional grant, the donors are programming up front or the investors are programming up front and essentially they're saying that you must do this. And we will count your performance based on input. So how many bed nets you sold, or rather distributed, or how many vaccines have gone here. And while the contractors, or rather the people who are programming it, may be thinking this is an outcome based, like if you deliver 20 bed nets, then you will get this. It's not, because when you pull back the curtains, the guys who are controlling the money, the treasury, the controllers, they're still counting it on input basis. Now, an impact bond is totally different. The investors are saying, okay, we want to take this risk. We think it's a good program. We're going to put our money up. And the donors are like, we don't care. Do what you want. I'm paying for the outcome. I'm not going to sit there and program it. So it's up to you. And this is really interesting because another real struggle that we have in the development world is that we're talking about getting evidence. Now, we, said, we want more evidence. Show me that my money is doing something. Show me results. But yet, Yet, we're not willing to actually listen to the results and listen to the data and read the data and do something about it. So let me give you an example. If I'm a, a guy sitting in a room and I've programmed, say, $10 million for uh, malaria, for dead net distribution, and after 15 months, I realize that nothing's happening. It's not doing it. Well, I can't actually go back to my manager and say, uh-oh, the numbers are telling us we're not doing it. Because he's like, you promised me it's going to happen. So there's that kind of... That, that, that indecision, that, that, that understanding, it's not working out, but we can't do anything about it because I might be afraid to tell my manager because I told him it was going to work out. Whereas on the impact side, okay, I have investors. They're putting the $10 million up. They're expecting the nets to be distributed because if the nets are not distributed, they are not repaid. So they're asking me, hey, you're getting data all the time in real time. Why aren't you changing? Why aren't you adapting? To the systems, why you're not becoming more um, performance-based. So th those are two different conversations, different perspectives. I think that's really important. So I'm going to go a little, a little quicker here. This is what the market looks like today. It's about 50 social impact bonds and development impact bonds in the market um, all over the world. It's been around since 2007. We can talk more about it later. Um, so there's, there's a couple examples I'll give you. One, so these are things that currently we're looking at um, at USAID. So this is a $50 million development impact bond that we're working with GIFID. It's in Uganda. It's around sleeping sickness. The idea essentially is that uh, there's 11 million cattle in Uganda. They get sick from TT flies, and then essentially $80 million a year is wiped out on productivity for, for the smallhold farmers. So what we're looking to do is to basically inoculate 4 million cattle over three years and then provide a community-based service where we go and teach the farmers how to spray their cattle for, for, for flies and for ticks and things of that sort. And, and uh, this is jointly done with DFID. Um, and hopefully by the end of next year, it will be up and running. It would be the first time that anyone did a development impact bond. Uh, another example, 
Yeah, this is in South Africa that actually I worked with, uh, before I was chair, I worked for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. And we did a development slash social impact bond in South Africa with sex workers. So essentially the conversation started one day where the Treasury said, I have $10 million but nobody wants this money to, to tackle high risk population. And we said, we'll take your $10 million and we'll basically roll out a program where we will get to X. And if we hit that number, we want you to basically pay back the investors. And I said, okay. Um, so South Africa has 150,000 sex workers, 70% are HIV positive, and less than 1% of the budget go to them. So this is, this is a huge problem. Um, and then now we're also looking in Haiti where we're doing a, a water uh, sanitation project that might be around $11 million um, in the same space. And this is something that's pretty new. But uh, I guess that's, that's the end of it. So I'm going to leave it there. And uh, if you have any questions, we can answer that later. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Amanda and Theo and Lawrence. And actually, thank you to all you guys for being so patient and wonderful as we bear with us with some um, fun morning surprises. Um, I do want to respect everyone's time, and, and I realize that we're coming up to 10.30, which we promised to give you all free. But um, if you have any questions, particularly on the how that people can then take with them to sort of think back how they would apply it, um, I want to get one question from the room and one question from the webinar, if there are any. Um, if you can wait till I pass you the microphone, say your name and organization, that sort of thing. Hi, I'm Peter Boone with Corona Corporation. I have a question, I think, for Lawrence and Amanda about the um, supply side, the supply side uh, incentive that you give to banks when they're lending. Uh, a pay for performance. It looks like the performance is really responding to what you look for, maybe even exceeding expectations. So I'm curious uh, at what stage you might turn off the spigot for the suppliers. And also, a second part of the question is, isn't the, is, that's especially if the demand side, um, you know, uh, BDS provider subsidy is creating the pipeline for them. And isn't that second um, <coughs> performance base a little more market based because you could make the argument that either the private SMEs or the banks would take on that, that incentive later on when they see the benefits? Thank you. And then we're actually going to take a couple questions from the webinar um, to wrap it all at once. OK. Can everyone hear me? Wonderful. I just want to give a shout out to our webinar participants who have been troopers throughout all of this. Um, most of them have stayed online throughout all of the audio issues, and they've been very active in the chat. Um, so one question from Flacia. Um, this is, I think, to Amanda about your presentation. Um, she was asking, which financial regulations deterred or promoted service delivery of various financial institutions in administering the grants that you spoke about? Sure, I can do that. Deterred or promoted service delivery of various financial institutions um, in administering the grants that you spoke about. And then okay. this, this is a question, um, I believe, for Adam um, from a couple of different people on the webinar. Um, they were just wondering, what is the total value of the 50 impact development um, bonds, and who were the investors? Then, <clears throat> Peter, what I really like about this uh, approach is really it does dial um, the, uh, the level of subsidy required. So it really allows us to sort of set a metric. And we're setting that metric based upon the response we've gotten from a competition. So in, in Ghana, we didn't set it at the very bottom of the pool because we wanted take up. But we didn't set it at the top of responses. But certainly, uh, one dials it down. And we could have dialed it up because our objective, again, in this case, was ensure that that finance was there to support the uh, value chain. Um, and in terms of the, the BDS, I mean, my expectation is that as this becomes interesting, um, the financial intermediaries themselves will hopefully become more adept at seeking out and identifying these transactions. And again, they will have invested to get their transaction costs to go down. As far as the uh, regulatory restrictions, um, that's, I don't 
uh, believe there were any, or if there were any, um, then a man is in big trouble, but I, I don't think so. But let me pass it over. No, I mean, is, it, is the issue, I, I guess the question is, is it a, a USAID regulation? Or is it, you know, um, host country regulations? There weren't any host country regulations sort of deterring us at all. Um, and in fact, you know, the government of Ghana is actually very hands-off in terms of uh, controlling what happens in the agricultural I mean, to, you know, maybe to detriment. They don't get involved in agricultural finance, and they got burned when they were really involved, and there was massive default, and they actually had to restructure their entire financial sector. So there's a reason why they're sort of what is fair there. But I did want to say that what it is important to um, say that this is innovative contracting, and a key success factor, and I'm remiss to not mention it, is that we had a really open-minded contracting office within USAID, and also a really top-notch team within Corona that helped us push the boundaries, <laughs> but it, within uh, um, the contractual requirements. So, and we had a really open-minded uh, uh, COR who gets finance. So those two things, I know many of you implementing partners in the room, when you don't have that, it can be really hard to be innovative uh, from an implementing partner perspective. And I'm just really glad to be working with some of the best people in the business on you know, all sides. So we're lucky. Um, hi. So, of, of the 50 sort of impact bonds, it's around 150 to 200 million dollars. Um, the pipeline for deals are, are probably closer to, to bring that would bring that up to about 500 million. And, and I say that um, looking kind of into the future, of what's on tap right now. And the initial impact bonds were very small, a couple hundred thousand dollars, or a million or two million dollars. But now they're starting to scale up because the cost of structuring and the understanding how they work and, the, and sort of the socialization has gotten uh, more, more uh, robust and fluid. Uh, some of the investors have been Goldman Sachs, UBS, um, European Investment Bank, FMO, high net worth individuals, and mom and pops. But it's moving more institutional now. Um, so for example, the Uganda project that we're looking at, uh, right now we've spoken to, and none of this is confirmed, so you know, just kind of take it for what it is, but UBS, FMO, European Investment Bank, KFW from Germany, these are the type of investors that are setting up willing to put money behind this. And actually, every single impact bond has always been oversubscribed. The issue is not actually the impact, looking for the money to come in and front load the program, it's finding the money to, to basically be the outcome funder, and that's where these projects fall apart. I do want to... Um get you all guys time to still network and mingle with one another. If you have any other questions that you think would be useful for the community, please email microlinks at microlinks.org and we'll share it out and follow up with our great presenters that I'm so thankful that they were able to join us here today. So thank you all. Um, do take our polls and feedback um, as we learn and adapt. We really care about um, all your input on that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> cool.